Well, thank you so much for being here. I hope that there's no one here who is faint of heart. This is not going to be um, the kind of conversation for the meek. We are going to get down to business because this is the topic that couldn't be more fun to talk about. Um, because how we do it hasn't, I don't, I don't think the act has actually changed since we started walking on two legs and then spreading them. <laughs> but there is a lot to be learned about it. So um, I can't even begin our conversation uh, without talking about some of the props that Robert has brought for us. Um, I have to ask you about this prop. I think you have to hold it up for us if you would. Uh, I know you might, well, I'm just going to tell you what it is because you're not going to guess. Or do you want to, why don't you? This is the penis bone from a male walrus. So it, this is actually a fossil. It was washed up on the beach in Alaska and it's been rolled by the waves. It's thousands of years old. And it's actually a small one because... <laughs> How do you like that? This is 18 inches long, but the record is 48 inches long. So, and this is a, a feature of many mammals, is that the male has a, a bone in the penis, but well, humans don't. Well, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is a good place to start. Um, especially since it has nothing to do with females, so we may as well start there. Um, you know, uh, why is it that we do not have penis bones? Um, yeah, we, got a, we have a slide for you. Check this out. What's with the forked... Some of these look like, well, instruments of torture. <laughs> well, not exactly torture, but stimulation. Uh -huh. And uh, there are many mammal groups uh, where the males have a bone in the penis and carnivores such as the walrus and insectivores, bats usually have them, most rodents and the top picture there on the left is, is of various rodents and uh, the bottom picture actually shows various carnivores and primates. So the group to which we belong, uh, most members have uh, penis bones, but there are exceptions, and we're one of them. The great apes have uh, penis bones, and most other primates do. Uh, and if you look across mammals, uh, there seems to be a link to uh, mating time, copulation time. And so in species where copulation is lengthy, then quite often the males have penis bone and it's part of the stimulation that goes on. Uh, humans actually are not very good in this. <laughs> uh, the, the average copulation time is about four minutes and we don't have a penis bone. And so uh, if you look across mammals generally, the reason we don't have one is because uh, we don't have these extended copulations that you see in many other mammals. Ah, okay, all right. Interesting. Um, and so, while we're, okay, while we're there, or down there, um, I, I just want, I just have to know a couple of things. It seems like the female reproductive system makes a little bit more sense to me, and it's not just because I'm female, uh, but to have it all internal seems to protect uh, pregnancy, and it seems to be, uh, it just seems like a pretty smart system. But men seem, they're just so vulnerable to have an exterior uh, testicles, genitals, it seems to make no sense that their sperm cannot be made in the body because the body temperature is too warm, so it's made outside the body. It, it seems like it's so vulnerable for, uh, for something that's so important to the species. So I'm wondering why. I completely agree with you. The uh, female approach to reproduction in mammals is much... Uh, smarter? Smarter. 
that, that, I'm just saying. That's the word. Uh, because first of all, it's more efficient to produce babies inside the body. Right. Okay, if you lay an egg, you're converting resources into an egg, and then the egg has to convert those resources into a baby. If you do it internally, it's direct. So you're saving energy, plus there's the protection you talk about. And while we're on the topic of protection, I mean, it seems unusual to say the least that uh, testes are descended. And this is in most mammals, okay? There are exceptions, but most mammals have descended testes like we do. Makes no sense. Well, it, you know, I mean, people have discussed, biologists talk all the time about reasons for everything, right? Right. And so there have been many theories about why we have descended testes. My favorite is gravity. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Somebody actually suggested that over time, because we uh, walk direct, that the, the gravity pulled the testes downwards, and I always imagine the heart and the kidneys in sacks outside the body, because <laughs> they're much heavier. But then uh, people saw that it had some connection with temperature. Uh, in humans, the testes are normally descended, but they can be retained through a developmental accident inside the body. And at that higher body temperature, they don't work. So you don't produce sperm if the testes are inside the body. But it's not sperm production that really matters. There are lots of mammals that still have testes inside the body, up, so up by the kidneys, and they produce sperm with no problem. So you can produce sperm at body temperature, but I think it's storage of sperm that matters, and there's quite a lot of evidence that this is what it's about. The average temperature in the if you're not wearing tight underpants, the <laughs> average temperature is four degrees Fahrenheit lower in the te for the testes than inside the body, and that makes a difference. Huh. <coughs> um, and what about size, testicle size, as it relates to size of mammals, reproductive prowess, anything? It, it's interesting, you can learn an awful lot from <laughs> simply weighing the testes or in fact you don't even have to cut them out and weigh them you can measure the lengths and widths and this get is a, a whole new area of research some of us may or may not want to go into yeah. but uh, if you measure any size factor with any mammals you really have to take body size into account okay so we look at testis size in relation to body size and one very interesting thing that has come out is that in mammals where the breeding system has a single male, uh, the testes are relatively small. And in mammals where there are several males competing and mating with the females promiscuously, the testes are relatively big. And this applies certainly for primates, but it applies for many mammals. So uh, we can then look at a species like ourselves and look at the testis size and say, what kind of social system would you expect, huh. given the testis size? And uh, the answer for humans is a single male breeding system. So what it doesn't tell us is whether that is monogamy uh. or harem. So it's single male, but it doesn't mean single female. Ah, I see. Now you have to do further analyses to find that out. OK. Um, I think we have a, we have a slide that shows um, one remarkable example of, of this, no, our friend the bonobo. The bonobo is, a, is also called the pygmy chimpanzee. So both chimpanzee species have really big testes. And they're much bigger than in humans. And the reason is that the, uh, in chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, m several males mate with every female when she is fertile, and uh, so sperms from different males compete in the tract, and one way of dealing with that competition is to produce a lot more sperm, so that explains, and you can see up there a comparison of the size of a chimpanzee testis with an orangutan, and orangutans have uh, about the same t size testes as, as men do. And orangutans live in a single male breeding system as well. So why do we need a quarter of a billion sperm to fertilize one egg? 
Like that's got to be one of the most basic questions sure, yeah. in your field. My favorite answer is because not one of them will ask the way. <laughs> okay. I like that. <laughs> but uh, that is to cover the fact that I really don't know. It's, it's a fundamental question with mammals generally. Is that all mammals have to produce millions of sperm? Uh, the average for humans now is about a quarter of a billion sperm, 250 million sperm, uh, to fertilize one egg. And we do know that if that level falls be below about 70 million, then fertility decreases. So for some reason, you need to have at least 70 million for normal fertility, and the average man has 250 million. So uh, why do you need so many? And there are two main competing uh, answers to that. One of them is sperm competition, as in the chimpanzees, that um, if a female is mated by more than one male, then having large numbers of sperm is great. But if you live in a one male system like gibbons and orangutans, the female is never mated or hardly ever mated by two males at once. So why do you still have these large numbers of sperm? And in fact, we have a quarter of a billion sperm in an ejaculate. A chimpanzee has a billion, four times as many. So these guys in direct competition with one another are producing four times as many as we do. And so it's really quite a, uh, an enigma why. The other suggestion, which is really quite neat, is that you probably learn this in school that uh, in the formation of sex cells is a special division process and the number of chromosomes is reduced by half in sperms and eggs and then when they fuse together in fertilization you restore the usual number of chromosomes so, and during this special cell process that produces sperms and eggs you get what is called crossing over the chromosomes cross over and exchange material. It's one of the big sources of variability that the evolution needs is crossing over during the formation of sperms and eggs. And there's a very neat correlation between the number of crossovers you have and the numbers of sperm. It's a, it's a fairly tight correlation so it suggests that maybe the huge number of sperms has to do with lottery tickets, basically, you're producing all of these different kinds of sperms. And apparently the system requires you to have a quarter of a billion lottery tickets uh, <laughs> to take care of all these variants that are being produced. So that's the opposite. Okay, and we know that there's a, uh, is it global kind of downward trajectory of sperm count? Yeah, it's, it's really quite frightening over the last 50 years in many countries, uh, at least, uh, sperm counts have declined uh, by about half. And it's been happening at different times in different places. In France, for example, over the last 20 years, there's been a decline. In other countries, it occurred earlier. There's a report from Israel recently that sperm counts again over the last 20 years have declined by half. We don't know what's happening in developing countries because nobody is following that and it could be that it's not happening everywhere. Hmm. Uh, all of the evidence points to something environmental. I think it's toxins in the environment that are responsible. But, and, and as I say, we have on average 250 million sperm to ejaculate. You need 70 million to be normally fertile. And the more sperm counts decline, the more men are going to drift into that area of having less than 70 million. So I think it's, it's serious enough to be worried. And the more fertility problems, the more assisted fertility, the more multiple births, the more, which are, yeah, we're on a, that's a, another question about I have, but we'll get to it later. Um, <laughs> Um, but let's let's switch sexes for a second and talk talk about um, the female reproductive system because um, there it, it it seems that across other species um, largely 
females of the species are fertile a couple of days, that's when they are um, willing to copulate with males, and that's it. Human beings, you know, supposed supposed to be a whole other uh, a whole other thing. You know, generally, sometimes females are open to uh, you know to copulate with males any time in their cycle. It seems inefficient in a way. You're absolutely right. I, this is something that struck me when I was doing my PhD 40 plus years ago. Uh, it, people just accept this and it's not really being... Well, some people don't accept it. Well, <laughs> that's right, but, it, but most people accept that uh, what you've just said, that that's what is in the textbooks, is what people generally <coughs> believe. And there are those who say that humans are unique. Now that isn't true because this question of mating for a large part of the cycle is something that appeared 40 million years ago in the common ancestor of monkeys, apes and humans. So it's not unique to us. We are probably extreme in that, uh, as you say, um, this can happen on any day of the cycle. Okay. But, and this is called loss of estrus. So, uh, estrus is heat. Mm -hmm. And most mammal, female mammals have a heat period of about three days. Right. And that seems to make a lot of sense because everybody claims that sperm survive two days and the egg at most one day. So uh, mating within that three day period is, is what you would expect. Once you start mating outside that period, then the danger arises that either you have an aging sperm that fertilizes the egg or an aging egg is fertilized by a fresh sperm. And I can't understand why that would ever evolve, and it, it really worried me. And it was in the process of writing the book that I finally saw what I think is happening, huh. which is that sperms are stored in the female tract. They are? And so once you get sperm storage, it changes the entire ball game, because if yeah. sperms survive not two days, but 10 days or even 16 days, as I have some evidence. In the human female? In humans. And that changes the entire ball game. That's big and, news. And, you know, uh, for example, the rhythm method of contraception, forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny because um, so, speak, you know, uh, the, in, the insect world is insane with examples of crazy, crazy methods of uh, reproduction. And one thing you mentioned, there's a, a beetle whose, uh, the male drills a hole in the side of the female, deposits a sperm into the bloodstream, then the, it circulates, and then the sperm go into a, a holding sack. And then whenever it's needed, to fertilize the egg, it, it's used. And there's like forked penises and double vaginas and there's, I mean there are coiled sperm and sperm that are as big as the insect and uh, two headed, it's like insane. I, we seem so boring in comparison. I mean not that I want, you know, the hole in the side or anything, right. but I mean we, we don't, Aren't we a little tame? But all of this falls into what zoologists call post-copulatory selection. So it's what happens after copulation inside the female's body. And insects have the most spectacular examples, as you've mentioned. Uh, but I think humans may be pretty spectacular because what I think happens is that our sperms are stored in the neck of the womb and maybe in the body of the womb and released slowly over about two weeks. Really? Yeah. That is, that's huge. And, and in fact, huge part of this of uh, extension of copulation over the cycle is topping up the reservoir of sperms waiting. Uh, and in hu the human system, that is a single male system, so we're talking about the same male mating repeatedly and keeping this reservoir and topping it, topping it up. And uh, you know, it's interesting, there is, I could only find one medical paper, we have known since 1980, that sperms are stored in the neck of the womb. 
and this was a, a group of Israeli doctors and they had women patients who were scheduled for a hysterectomy to have the womb removed and the day before uh, these women signed up to have artificial insemination done and then the next day the womb was removed and the doctors sectioned the womb and they found 200,000 sperms in the crypts in the neck of the womb. These are the crypts that produce the mucus that everybody gets so excited about. Oh. But those same crypts that are produced, the sperm swim up the mucus and into the crypts and then they're slowly released. And we know that they remain fertile for five days, that's for sure. But I have indirect evidence that it's probably more like 16 days maximum. So it's more than half the cycle. So would that explain uh, the idea that, because um, you, you found that people can get pregnant on almost any day of a cycle. Right. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Would, would that be the explanation? Absolutely. I, and it's quite interesting because I started reading some of these papers when I was doing my PhD and uh, the, these papers were particularly published in Germany and I was doing my PhD in Germany so I could read them. Um, uh, after both world wars or during both world wars there were uh, doctors publishing information from soldiers home on leave for just two days for example and, and uh, information from women and uh, they were making it absolutely clear that conception was not confined to the middle of the cycle. It could happen anywhere. And I put together 4,000 cases from uh, these papers in working for the book. And I mean, there are two things that are obvious. First of all, uh, conception can happen on any day of the cycle, but it's more likely in the first half than in the second half. And uh, uh, so that, that is absolutely clear that you can conceive uh, anywhere in the cycle. But the other thing which is, is interesting and fits with what I'm saying, the peak is not on day 14. It's not in the middle of the cycle when ovulation occurs, it's day 8. Six days before ovulation, on, ov on, on average, conception occurs with sperms that were introduced six days before ovulation took place. That's what these data are telling us. And there's a recent study which did computer modeling, taking all we know about the human cycle and so forth, but assuming that sperms could survive five days. But the curve they produce is pretty close to mine, and if you extend that to 10 days instead of five, it will match perfectly. So um, the latest evidence is actually fitting this picture. Huh, that's fascinating. Um, <clears throat> well, if we move uh, down the time, talking about you know evolution and pregnancy, um, I have to ask. It, it seems like a ridiculously difficult uh, business having a baby, right? And and it doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I mean, here we have. Pro I mean, everything we do is supposed to be for propagation of the species, and yet it is so difficult. Human birth is so difficult. Babies' heads are so big. Um, you know, we've outsmarted Mother Nature in a way, uh, in that we've in interfered with so much technology, but to a certain extent, to a good thing, because there are a lot more healthy babies born now, um, at least in this country. But it just doesn't make any sense to me. Can you enlighten me specifically <laughs> about why human birth is so difficult if, I mean, it just seems antithetical to, to having, propagating the species. Sure, uh, and in this case, there really are unique fe features about humans. The bottom line is that birth is very, very difficult for humans compared to all other primates. Yes. And the reason for that is, is shown here is that the, the baby's head will only just pass right. through the pelvic canal. And, you know, some of my work has been involved in interpreting human skeletons that you find in archaeological digs. And if you want to know the sex of a, a human skeleton, the best thing to look at is the pelvis. And you can get at least 95% of the time you can get it right <coughs> if you have the pelvis. And if you look at the pelvic canal, 
here in, in a woman uh, as this is there are lots of different things that make this whole here yeah, the, the pelvic canal smoother and rounder uh, this part at the bottom of the spine the, the sacrum is, is moved backwards and this joint here is, is much shorter than in men and you have a wide angle here and this whole thing is rounded to allow the baby's head to pass through and in a man uh, the aperture is heart shaped because you don't need to get the base of a man's spine, spine out of the way for a baby to go through and so it's features like that that tell me pretty immediately with any skeleton whether it's from a man or, or a woman and basically what's happened I said it's more efficient to produce things inside the body so what's happening is we have very big brains and we develop as much as we can before birth and because it's efficient uh, this has been pushed to the limit so brain development of the fetus goes just as far as it can to get through the pelvis and uh, there's a concept called genetic pruning it's interesting that uh, selection has clearly operated to limit baby's head size so there's a cutoff on the distribution of head size for new newborns and the opposite is true with uh, the pelvis you measure the size of this aperture there is a cut of, of, of small apertures so selection has acted against a pelvis with two smaller canal or baby's heads that are just too big but uh, we push to the limit so that the baby's head will just go through and something unique has to happen because the baby's head will only just go through so it first of all turns 90 degrees to face sideways because that's the easiest way to go through the beginning and then it rotates another 90 degrees and the baby is looking backwards when it's born whereas in other primates the baby is looking forwards at birth and so it's a really tight squeeze and we have to have this complex rotation and almost certainly once our brains reached a certain size that would have meant midwives became essential and are our brains growing? Are we going to grow ourselves out of existence? I, you know, people uh, think that that might happen. I, I, quite often I get questions at the end of any presentation, what's going to happen in the future? Yeah. I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, if you study evolution, you, you can explain what happened in the past, but you can't really predict what's going to happen in the future. But People think because our brains have tripled in size over five million years that that process is going to continue. Right. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, with the increasing numbers of cesarean sections, we're removing this constraint. And so it could be that if we do like vets are doing with some dogs, where 90% of births have to be by cesarean, uh, maybe we can allow the head of the baby to get bigger at birth and that would be the first step towards us having bigger brains in the future but one thing I would emphasize in evolutionary biology it's always very complicated there are so many factors and if you change one you're going to have knock-on effects elsewhere uh, one uh, comparison that was made is if you take a, a, a piece of, of knitting and you pull on one thread. Yeah, sure. The whole thing is sure. going to change. <laughs> um, uh, so another thing um, that I know you talk a lot about is the ratio. And no woman in the audience will dispute this fact, that um, you found that uh, women's brains in pregnancy actually decrease by 6%. Fortunately for us, it comes back, but not for a while. Now, and why is that? Like, it's not bad enough. We have to carry the baby and do all the work. We got to have the brain thing too. That's, it's par for the course. And uh, this has only been known for a couple of years. The paper that this comes from uh, is published, well, 10 years. Um, and what it shows on the left is, is the size of women's brains. This is done with a, an MRI scanner. 
and you can calculate the volume of a woman's brain. And what they found is exactly what Gwen said, is that the brain over the course of the 40-week pregnancy will decrease in size by about 6%. And it's a small sample, but it, it seems to be convincing. The reason this study was done was they were studying a condition called preeclampsia, which is associated with high blood pressure. And they did a study and found that the women's brains decreased in size during pregnancy. And initially they thought that that was due to the preeclampsia, but then a clever doctor said, well, what happens in normal pregnancy? And so that's why they did this study and showed in perfectly normal pregnancy, a woman's brain declines in size by 6%. The thing is that uh, the developing brain requires special fatty acids called polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the omega-3 and omega-6 uh, things that you can buy in Walgreens. Yeah, can't they just yeah. take it out of the bloodstream? Do they need to take There's it directly enough, from the brain? Uh, the, the thing is that uh, you have to get this in the diet. Right. We can't make these, uh, um, uh, so we have to get them in the diet of whatever you eat, you can't get enough quickly enough for that big brain. And so what a woman is doing is cannibalizing her own brain. Telling you the indignity. Throughout never pregnancy. Ends. And as Gwen said, it takes six months to put it back again afterwards. So it, it's, you know, yet another sacrifice that women make. I hope one thing that comes clearly out of my book is I really admire women for what <laughs> they have to go through. <laughs> Damn straight. Okay. Um, all right, there's so many things I want to get to, and we have such limited time. Uh, one of them is uh, monogamy. Right. Um, I, I, I know nobody will ever be able to answer the question of whether human beings were meant to be monogamous or not. Um, but evolutionarily speaking, uh, it doesn't... I mean, it makes a little bit of sense, you know, child rearing, all that, but if you take a look at the animal world and the insect world where it's all about competition of sperm, it makes kind of no sense. So I'm just wondering, is this like a social construct or is it an evolutionary, you know, biological construct? Sure. I mean, in, in us, clearly it's a mixture of culture and biology, but as a biologist, what I wanted to do is ask whether we can find any indicators as to what our biological adaptation would be. And as I've said, uh, some evidence points to us having a single male mating arrangement. Mm -hmm. But that could be one man with one woman, or it could be a one man with two or more women. And, uh, the information I suggest, it doesn't actually tell us one way or the other. Uh, but uh, what we can do is look at other things. Um, Wait, does that mean that you're saying one man, many women, but not one woman, many men? No. Uh, that's extremely rare. And there was a cross-cultural study of mm. hundreds of human <laughs> scientists that was done, which uh, showed that 85% uh, of human societies around the world are polygamous, so there's one man with two or more wives, and 15% were uh, monogamous, and a fraction of a percent were, were polyandrous, where there was a, a woman with more than one man. But there are a couple of cases. Right, but, but is there more evidence coming out now, more recently, that um, that it, there's more of that than we previously thought, just because people are being a little bit more honest now, et cetera, et cetera. No, I'm serious. I mean, I, I don't mean just that, <clears throat> I mean, that societal structures say one thing, but does reality say something sure. else? I, I, I yeah, our cultural influences are so strong that we've changed everything. Yeah. So it could be whatever our biological inclinations, that monogamy turns out to be the norm, and it, it wouldn't conflict with the biological base because the, the bottom line is we're adapted for a single male arrangement, and whether that's monogamous or harem living, it's not too important. But we can look at other evidence, and one neat uh, thing is that if you look across primates, species that live in pairs, so you have a monogamous mating arrangement, 
never show any distinct sexual dimorphism. That means there's no clear physical difference between males and females. For example, in body size. Uh, in monogamous primates, uh, the males and females are about the same size. And so we can look at humans and s see the degree of difference in body weight. And in fact, we're just outside the range for monogamy, but it... Um, we're just outside the range for monogamy? 15% uh, difference, so anything more than a 15% difference between male and female body weight is, is indicating you're out of monogamy. And, uh, and we're just above that, but the, it's actually more than that, because there's another unique thing about humans, which you find in no other primate, is that uh, women have 25% fat. Right. In their bodies, and men have. Don't remind me. Well, and 14 percent. 14 percent of men, on average, uh, uh, sorry, 14 percent fat in men. So it, it, it's around half in men. So the amount of muscle and the rest of the body is actually more different when you take the fat away, which is just a, an unusual feature of humans. Probably related to giving fat to the baby uh, during right. pregnancy. So uh, if you look at our sexual dimorphism, then the biology is telling us that we are outside the range of monogamy. Interesting. But the, the other thing is that uh, any kind of adornment that distinguishes males from females is again unusual to absent in monogamous primates. So the fact that men grow beards and women don't is again telling us that we're not monogamous. Huh? By biology. You hear that? So, what does that say about, um, uh, well, related, not related, but um, are, do we know if we're the only species that have orgasms? Do we know if that is something, I mean, I've heard said, you know, um, that that's why you're going to make it, obviously people want to come back for more, it's an evolutionary um, strategy, blah, 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 but really, are we the only ones? The answer is no. And, uh, you know, there are so many cases where people have said humans are unique because... Right, right, right. And then when you... Because we like to think we're unique, that's, that's why. That's right, exactly. <laughs> and then when you look for the facts... Science, to, right. And orgasms are one of them. There are many, many primates that have been shown to have orgasms. and. You can measure it physiologically. There. I was going to say, are we asking them? Are we just guessing by what sounds they make? You could, uh, there are physiological ways of doing this. There are um, changes in uterine activity and things like that. And it's linked to oxytocin. Mm -hmm. So oxytocin, the love hormone, plays a part in orgasms as well. And we know there are at least 30 other primate species that have them. Chimps have them. Um, and there's a very nice study, it was published in Science in 1980. So why anybody since then has been claiming that orgasms are unique to us, I don't know. They actually had electrodes attached to the females and showed them having e orgasms just like women. And the interesting thing is the best orgasms they got were two females together. <laughs> I'm speechless. Um, okay, well, we have to wrap it up because we want to leave time for your questions, but I think I will just um, ask, uh, well, I have so many questions, um, but I guess I would ask, just in closing, um, at what point do trends in childcare, do trends um, that you study become evolutionarily significant and you know if we go for 50 years carrying our children close to our bodies does it become significant or whatever the example is and as an evolutionary biologist you know you're here on this you're studying this enormous amount of time and you're here for a very short amount of time is it somehow set unsatisfying to see you know to just be here for a blip and I guess that, that's my question. Now, this relates directly to the question I often get about the future. Right. And uh, 
the, the thing is evolution has a long time scale and that's why a lot of people have difficulty grasping it because who knows what a million years means. Right. But uh, the thing is that the likelihood of positive things changing is, is very small over a short period of time but unfortunately negative things can happen relatively quickly. Like the sperm count. <coughs> like the sperm count right. which as far as we know is environmental at the moment but could become genetic uh, eventually and uh, the things I worry about are, are not uh, positive changes in, in mother care for example but negative changes what are, what are the side effects going to be of eliminating breastfeeding for right. example and, and all the things society does I mean you know that I followed a, a discussion on Facebook today about a, a woman in a restaurant not f feeling she couldn't breastfeed right. and so on you know, I mean, we're actually putting obstacles in the way of people behaving naturally. Right. And, uh, and our medical interventions, and, uh, and there's so many right, things. That's right, you add medical interventions and all right. the toxins we're releasing right. into the environment, etc. You know, that, that's what we should be worrying about, is, is fighting off all the negative changes. Okay. Well, we want to uh, open it up to questions, and then also, just so you know, there's a question up there. Um, also, just so you know, uh, we have to, when our time is up, we have to skedaddle out of the theater, but uh, Robert is going to be signing books, and you can ask him as many questions as you want afterwards. Go ahead. Yes, I've read elsewhere that one of the reasons that there are so many sperm versus one being needed to fertilize an egg was that in a sperm competitive environment, some sperm actually had the job of blocking others of tackling and only a few were designated fertilizers. Oh, football. Has that idea fallen into disfavor? Did you hear that question? Oh, yes. Yeah, the question is, is about the possibility that there might be different kinds of sperms. Uh, there is a theory which is called the kamikaze sperm hypothesis. <laughs> By the way, I write a regularly monthly blog on Psychology Today, and it just so happens that today I put in my latest blog, which is about the kamikaze sperm hypothesis. And I didn't have space to go into that in my book. And the thing is that it was suggested by uh, Robin Baker and Mark Bellis in 1988 that uh, human sperms are not all the, the same, that there are different categories, and there are uh, what he called egg getters, which are a small minority, which are actually there to fertilize the egg, and they're a kamikaze sperm. And he later divided those into blockers that get in the way and hunter killers. <laughs> and great stuff, sold a lot of books. But the thing is, it's totally wrong. And <laughs> The, it's a very interesting point because you have 250 million sperm in the ejaculate and the criteria have been getting tighter but the latest uh, World Health Organiza uh, Organization data recognized 4% as normal. So we have all of these vast numbers of sperm and 96% of them are duds. Okay. And Robin Baker and Mark Bellis would like to interpret the duds as some kind of special adaptation. But the thing is, what you would expect coming back to sperm competition is if you've got a species with sperm competition, that is where you would most expect to find the duds. Because that is where the blockers and the hunters and killers would be most useful. And it's the exact opposite. If you look at a chimpanzee uh, and look at its uh, sperm, they have much less garbage in their sperm than we do in their semen. And so they just have a few percent of dud sperm and all the rest are, are clearly quite, uh, quite normal. And if you look at a gorilla, which has small testes like we do, gorillas have exactly the same lousy sperm picture as humans do. So it looks as though we just can't be bothered to clean up our act and so only 4% of the sperms are actually of any use and 96% and, and what we're basically doing is leaving it up to the female tract to sort it up yet again.
you know, but the thing is, that would make such a beautiful analogy with the blockers and the punters and the, you know, and football. Well, oh, it's from Sunday it's nights. From, yeah. Anyway, any other questions? <laughs> yes. Oh, the microphone is coming down. You spoke about the uh, female brain getting smaller during gestation. How does that um, rear its ugly head, so to speak? Uh, did, does she have less thinking capacity? Is it behavioral changes? What, what goes on that we might notice during that time? Did you, did you hear that question? Okay, so the question is, in what way is the 6% reduction in brain capacity for women during pregnancy, in what way is that manifested? Other than, well, not being able to remember anything. Uh. Right. I, it's a, a very good question, of course, and of interest to at least half the people in the audience. <laughs> and uh, I, the trouble is that the, that picture, the data I have are, are 10 years old, so people haven't got around to doing any good studies of what had happened. My research assistant, Edna Davian, uh, when she was pregnant with her boy, used to say to me that she suffered from pregnesia. Exactly. <laughs> And so there are anecdotal accounts that women do have problems with memory and, and uh, so on, uh, which get tr progressively worse during pregnancy. So, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be the case. It could be that they're removing material from their own brains to put them into the fetus and that it's not having much effect. But there is a danger that there is a downside uh, to that and that women really are sacrificing themselves as pregnancy goes on. That's just the beginning. <laughs> Actually, we, if we could Any? go right here first, I want to make sure we're ping-ponging across the room. Thank you. Uh, my question is also about sperm count. So, uh, you mentioned that the human sperm count is going down due probably to environmental um, factors. If that is actually the case, uh, wouldn't that affect the animal kingdom the same way? Did you? Didn't. The question is, if, uh, if sperm counts are going down would, uh, in humans, wouldn't that affect, and, it, and it's environmental, in fact, wouldn't that also affect the animal species, the animal kingdom? Right. Are their sperm going down as well? That's a, an excellent question, because uh, if it's a general environmental effect, like uh, the ozone hole, somebody has suggested that the increase in ozone in the environment is responsible, then you might expect it to affect everything. Uh, but if it's something that's unique to humans, like drinking water out of plastic bottles, uh, and BPA, which is used to harden plastic, is, is a, uh, a serious candidate for an environmental toxin. It's known that it behaves like an estrogen. And that is something that will be much more specific to us. And one of the uh, criticisms of the early publications on sperm count declines was that apparently there was a change in sperm counting procedures at some time, and they said it's not a decline, it's a step function. The sperm counts remain constant until they change the, uh, the counting procedure and then they dropped and then they've stayed low ever since. And uh, this is where lateral thinking comes in because a vet in Australia said, well, if that is true, then sperm count should have declined in, cow, uh, in cattle and in pigs and in sheep because we use exactly the same sperm counting techniques and found absolutely no change at all over the period where our sperm counts were declining. And so it's an environmental factor, I think, and it's one that is specific to us. It is not affecting even our domestic mammals. Hmm. All right. Is there any correlation between decrease in brain size and postpartum depression? Is there any correlation between the decrease in brain size in females in pregnancy and postpartum depression? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, but uh, as I say, it's only recently been discovered that there is this brain uh, size de decline. So very little work has been done on it. 
there are studies, and I mentioned these in my book, about um, uh, factors related to postpartum depression. One of the specific factors is breastfeeding. Uh, postpartum depression is, is less likely if a woman is breastfeeding than if she isn't. And uh, stress, general stress seems to be another factor involved in it. Recent bereavement, for example, uh, can be a factor. Moving house. You know, it's not a good thing if you're in late pregnancy to change where you live. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, and there are various factors like that that are known to be linked, but nobody has looked at any connection with this brain size change. But the thing is that it's happening during pregnancy, so this 6% is being lost up to birth. As soon as the baby is born, the mother starts putting it back again. So she should actually get uh, better progressively, but it takes six months, as I say, to get back to where she was. We have time for one more question. Anybody? Oh. And now this, this may not actually be true, but it seems to me that I read at one point that uh, when they started to do DNA testing, they found that babies were not always the children of the fathers who were taking responsibility for them. And that seems to speak to the issue of polygamy on the part of women rather than on the part of men. So is this something I imagined or is this, can you speak to that? Oh, gladly. Uh, the, question, <laughs> the question is basically about DNA testing and human paternity. Okay. And this is part of the uh, Baker and Bellis sperm wars idea is that a significant proportion uh, of women actually copulate with a man in the same cycle so that the sperm from two different men are present simultaneously. That's what you need for sperm competition. And uh, uh, Robin Baker wrote a very successful book called Sperm Wars on this basis. Uh, but the thing is there are these apocryphal stories of people doing DNA studies of housing estates and finding a third of the babies are not the children of the man of the house, but if you look at serious studies worldwide, the average is about 2%. Okay, so it, it's very low. There are a few unusual exceptions, but by and large, there are 2%. Now, this is stunning, because people have found that birds, which we all thought were the paragons of monogamy, uh, are doing that all the time. If you look at DNA in a bird's nest, half of it is from some other male. So these paragons of monogamy, the birds, are doing all of these naughty things off in the bushes. <laughs> and humans who are being accused of engaging in sperm wars actually only have 2% non-pair uh, non paternity. Interesting to see where that will be in a million years. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I think we have to, unfortunately, wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Martin. <laughs>